This is the Bell Books and Stories podcast with me, Kay Hutchison. Welcome. I'm your host, Kay Hutchison, and you're listening to the Bell Media podcast, where we take a look at some great books and the stories behind the books. In this episode, I'm speaking to the critically acclaimed English novelist Mavis Cheek, author of 16 novels, including her award-winning debut, Pause Between Acts, Mrs. Fitton's Country Life, and one of my favourites, Amenable Women. She is a comic writer who, in the words of The Observer, may well be the spokeswoman for a generation. Her novels have been described as comedies of middle-aged manners, She has been described as Jane Austen in modern dress and Bridget Jones 20 years on. But this is to underestimate her art. There are serious issues in her writing and whatever the truth of these statements, her work has won her legions of adoring fans, not just in the UK but around the world and her books have been widely translated into other languages too. Mavis has had a fascinating life and career path. She is a feminist and politically engaged in some of the most important issues of today. She does charitable work, leads numerous writing retreats, and seems to champion many whom she comes into contact with, particularly those with talent, but perhaps lacking in confidence. Hello, Mavis. It's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to Bell Books and Stories. Thank you. And I'm actually really impressed with where you've gone with this. It's amazing. Well done. Oh, good. (laughs) Excellent. Well, I would like to start um, by looking at the early influences in your life. Uh, You were interested in theatre and also art, and your first job was working for a contemporary art publisher, and that must have given you a good grounding in publishing. So how did you move on and start your writing career? I would love to hear how it all happened. <laughs> well, the publishing was really about making prints. We, we made the first Hockney prints, uh, some, of the, some of the most revolutionary stuff going on then. So it wasn't um, literature publishing, if you like. Um, so I was working right in the heart of the contemporary world and did that for 12 years. And then I was married and I thought I would uh, like to start a family. Uh, And I was told I couldn't, that I wouldn't be able to have babies. I had no idea why. Um, You know, one one accepted things in those days. And then we got divorced. I don't know if that was to do, I can't remember if it was to do with that or anything else. But then I thought, well, what can I do? I've only got half a brain. Well, I failed my 11 plus, as you probably know, and went to a very ordinary secondary modern where I was only allowed to learn to be a clerk typist because I was not considered bright enough to be a secretary. (laughs) You can imagine. Um, So I, but I'd had a ball. I'd had a ball in the 60s and the early 70s in the art world. So I was full of vim and vigour. And I went to college and I did a, a degree there. And I was just about to go and do my MA at Goldsmiths um, when I found out I was pregnant. (laughs) Wonderful. Strange things happen when you're doing a degree. Um, I think I know what caused it. And uh, so I had to diversify, and I did. I wanted the baby so much that um, I was with Basil Beatty, a painter, and we set up home together, and I thought, what can I do to be at home with this baby? I'll be a writer. That's what it was, just like that. And and actually, you started writing, and just really really enjoyed it is that I mean can you tell me how that how that actually began I always wrote even at school amongst all the other things you know I was singled out as being really good at writing composition as we called it um I always wrote letters to friends I've got boxes and boxes of their replies we did that in those days we didn't have email or anything like that so I loved writing letters and some of them were quite wacky and people loved them and so I've always enjoyed it it was the it was getting to a point of disciplining yourself to writing something that was complete like a short story or a book indeed or even an article that I had to learn to do and that's what I that's what I was doing. Well, my daughter would wake up for a feed and I'd feed her and then I'd chuck her in the cradle and whiz downstairs and do another sort of hour and a half or something and then she'd cry. So it was a bit like that. But I 
I learned the craft that way. I learned, I gave myself seven years until Bella would be leaving junior school, um, uh, leaving infant school to go on to junior school. And then I thought if I haven't made it by then, I'll just have to get a proper job. And my first book was actually bought by an agent when she was seven. <laughs> so how about that? That was that is absolutely terrific. Um, because because that must have given you huge amounts of confidence to to keep going. Um, you once said, uh, actually, no, I'm going to ask you because you you talked about wacky um write, wacky writing, um, and you once described yourself looking back as one in a line of feminist subversive women authors with jokes. Is that what you meant by wacky? What what did you mean by that? And and what kind of feminist are you? I mean, feminism is so such a general term for what is quite a complex topic especially today getting more so I would say oh absolutely I mean I, I I'm I wouldn't be out there on the streets now manning you know, womaning the barricades because I wouldn't quite know what I thought about anything but I think I was thinking about people I mean they were these are much better writers than me I was was rather fluffy by comparison I think but uh, at heart you know Margaret Atwood Beryl Bainbridge Bernice Rubins those are the women of my time who were writing these wonderful books but they were slightly subversive they didn't sort of you know they didn't conform they weren't romances they weren't necessarily family sagas uh, and they had some bite to them um and i i just discovered my authorial voice when i started writing i had no idea that i could write comedy and I think we might come on to that, but I I always thought that comic writing was very inferior and that I really ought to be writing high art. Hmm. I know that you once said you saw yourself as being a serious writer alongside James Joyce and Virginia Woolf rather than a successful writer of witty comic tales about, about women. But actually, there's a huge and real market for what has become your own personal voice in writing. And actually, what I think is so interesting is the fact that there are many serious ideas and issues that you explore, albeit in a, in a funny way. So, I mean, do, do you still wish you had were able to be a serious writer? Are you quite happy where you are? Yes, I, I think because it gives you a license to, to use both. Um, which is which is wonderful. If you can write comedy, it's a great gift. Um, I had no idea I had it. But you can also, as you exactly said, you can bring in the, the darker side of things, the more questionable things, and, and pop them in. Um, I suppose I was just thinking that I wanted to push out the bounds of 20th century fiction, <laughs> which which soon went out of the window. And did your, your own life suggest a particular path in in sort of doing writing sort of feminist writing is, is that where that interest came from or something else did something happen that made you interested in a, in a women's perspective on life um I was brought up by uh, in, in a house where the women were supreme my mother was awful it was she was she was uh, bigamized so she was left with two small children uh, and she had to, you know, go out to work and look after us and do all that. And my grandmother, who is an absolute Tartar, came to look after us. So these two extremely strong women. My grandmother had had ten children in Islington, and um, you know, had, had brought them up almost single-handedly. Um, so I was, I suppose, that was there in the psyche that women are very strong, and they seemed rather undermined sometimes. Yes, that must have had quite an an impact on you as a young girl. Yes, I think it did, without me knowing it. Um, I think I was, if you'd known me when I was with my boyfriend, who I then married, between the ages of sort of sixteen and twenty-two, I was quite sublimated, really. I was just so grateful that anybody wanted me that, uh, you know, I held myself in. And then after we separated, I developed fully, I think. And I just want to talk about the subjects for your um, books. I mean, I mean, 16, that is, a, you know, a huge amount of writing. You also do short stories. But how do you choose the subjects for your books? Does it, does it pop into your head or is, it a, is there a plan? It's always about something that's happened at some point 
a lot of art, uh, writers say this, I think. It, it is like that little bit of grit in the oyster, a thought, something you've seen, something someone said, uh, and it works away until, you, you know, you think I'm going to explore that. That's, that's what usually happened to me. The other thing about it was that I was always terrified that I would never be able to write another book after I'd finished one. So I was, I think um, it might have been Beryl Bainbridge who said to me, you, you have to be like an alcoholic, you have to have another bottle on the shelf behind you. <laughs> uh, that's what that bit of grit always was. And can you tell me um, how much research goes into the writing, say, for Amenable Women? Amenable Women um, I enjoy hugely, um, and I was particularly drawn to it, not just because of the fantastic new cover that it's got, but also this appeal of the real historical story of King Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anna of Cleves, not Anne of Cleves, as everyone says, but with a modern day story of a woman accepting her position in support of her husband, rather than her exp- expressing all that she has to offer in life. Mm. Um, I, you know, th- th- these uh, themes, as I'm just saying that to you, I'm realising where this has all come from as you were growing up and the experiences that you had but there must be an enormous amount of research um having read amenable women i mean it's just it's it's full of of detail well if i tell you Kay, that i reveled in it because i decided to do the research without taking any notes don't ask me why i decided to do that laziness possibly but um, and I read every single book I could and went to the British Library, but mainly I did it through all the books in the world that I could get hold of about her and about Cleves and all sorts. And it, I used to say to friends, you know, can you believe I am lying on my bed reading books that fascinate me and it's called work? <laughs> it seemed extraordinary. Um, so really what I did was I took out of that the things that stuck in my mind so that I wasn't sort of making notes and then going bonkers with too many notes about too much stuff. But the the crux of that book was really that I I, I don't write historical novels. I don't want to invent scenes between characters in history. Um, That's not my, you know, um, other people do it wonderfully, but I don't want to do that. So if you notice, that book has nothing in it about Anna that can't be verified by state papers and and letters and things you know people what people have written or said at the time that makes it all the more interesting i'm sure for people who haven't yet read it um you talked about characters in your books originating in real life even although obviously you're not just telling the story of other people's um you know events that happen in their life would would friends who know you uh, recognize some of the people in your books and and is that ever a problem <laughs> Okay, you're asking me to spill a secret here. Though, I <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, well, I'll tell you a reverse thing that happened, which was absolutely, which, which happened the other way around. A very dear friend of mine uh, who is quite wealthy and who always used to do lovely things for us because we didn't have much money, Baz and I, and when Bella was growing up. Um, and I published Pause Between Acts, my first book, and we were all, you know, great celebrations about that. And then I published my second book parlor games and i got the big freeze from this woman and it was only years late and uh, she happened to be married to one of my oldest friends so it was quite difficult but it was years later that her sister put us back together again and, and said explained that she'd taken me for a celebratory lunch at the savoy for my other book and then we'd gone to the shops and things and she used a gold card which was a brand new thing. No, I'd never seen one before. They were new in those days. And it was quite fun, this gold credit card. Um, so in the book, I put a woman, a particularly unpleasant woman, um, buying her tampons with her gold credit card because I, you know, I just thought it was a kind of bathos. And my friend thought I was taking a poke at her. Gosh. Yeah, I know, it was hard. Yeah. Anyway, we're fine now. We go away together and all sorts of things. But it obviously went deep for her. It never occurred to me. Mm. And, and all those years, all those kind of wasted years in, in between, you were never thinking the same thing. You weren't on the same track at all. Anyway, it's nice that it's had a, a happy ending. It is quite useful. You can actually 
<laughs> I shouldn't be telling you this, but you can, if someone crosses you, I'm not a person to do big confrontations, and I don't get riled very much, but if someone does something particularly nasty to me, I can put them in a book, and I enjoy that. And, you, and you, does that feel cathartic? <laughs> oh, very. Yes, absolutely. You, you bet. <laughs> so um, I just want to come on to um, books and writing. Uh, as a writer, I'm often told that I should be writing like X thousand words every day to practice and refine my skills. Um, is that something that you would recommend too? Or do you simply love writing so much that it's just what you have to do naturally? Well, I think it's a good idea to keep writing, even if you feel you're writing rubbish, because you often you're not, but at least it keeps the process going. I've never, ever been one to say that you should write a certain number of words every day. Um, I'll give you a little example of that. My dear old friend, DM Thomas, he was commissioned to write um, Solzhenitsyn's biography by an American publisher, and they wanted something like 800,000 words, you know, big. Mm. And Don worked out that he could, if he wrote something like 112 words a day, you know, they'd given him three years to do it, I don't know, 180 words a day or something, he would get there in the end. <laughs> and that's what he used to do. <laughs> you know, as long as he got 180 words down, he didn't care if he went on or not, you know. And I thought, well, we all have our own ways of, of playing the game. I mean, you have to play with yourself a bit when you're writing, I think. I agree. I agree. I think you've got to find the thing that works for you, and it's all it's all very different. Can you paint a picture of what your writing setup uh, is like at home? You used to live in uh, Wiltshire. Yes. Moved to um, what you call Raffish, Brentford, and West London, where you're settled now. Sounds like quite a change of scene. What's your setup like now? It, it is. A, it is, and it isn't a change of scene. The change of scene was that, and I wrote Mrs. Fitton's Country Life to stop me moving to the country because I could feel this thing coming on. <laughs> and then when it was published, I did move to the country, and that was wonderful. I loved it. I lived in a house that was that isolated, totally isolated. Um, but then good sense kicked in about uh, four years ago. <laughs> And I thought, well, I'm not getting any younger and I'm leaping up and down the outdoor wooden steps to get logs in the icy winter and, you know, the whole thing's crazy. Um, so I moved back and I am a Londoner, so I'm back home, really. Yes. Wimbledon, wasn't it, you started in? Yeah, yeah. And do you have to have um, uninterrupted time to write? Can you paint a picture of what it's like? I mean, is your, do you have a, a, a sort of very comfortable room? Does it have to be really warm? It's you... the front bedroom of the house I bought. So it's a nice big room. I remember a writer friend of mine saying, you know, why do, why do women stick themselves away in tiny little rooms to write? You know, if they're writers, they, they, can, they, they should have space. And I've always thought, yeah, she's absolutely right. So I'm surrounded by books, uh, portraits. Um, I have a very big, nice big desk, comfortable chair. Um, and at the moment, I'm I'm not writing at all. <laughs> um, that's because I started, I decided to diversify. I think we're going to talk about this too. You know, I'd written that many novels, and that was lovely. And it was really nice to have some re-released and all that. But I really wanted to have a go at writing a play. So I started to write a play. And then all the theatres closed. <laughs> so I'm sulking at the moment. I'm, I'm sulking. Quite understandable. And do you um, have a time when uh, you, I mean, you're a late person or an early person when you're writing? The pattern became I would take Bella to school, walk with Bella to school, and then come back. And it would be like opening the door on an office, you know, it would be like coming back to work. And then I would work through the morning, um, probably until about to have something to eat and then a little bit more and then go and pick her up from school. And that would be the day. When I was editing, I used to edit at night because it was quiet. So basically that's the way it worked. But generally speaking, it would be morning through till about two. Mm, a sort of really nice sort of mor morning start, and then you've got the rest of the day to yeah. to do other ordinary things. Do you occasionally have challenges when writing to deadlines? Not not just obviously. I th I think there's a huge amount of challenges just now during COVID, and and you know as you know the 
the whole art theatre scene, everything hugely hit by this. But mm. um, do you personally have challenges writing to to deadlines, and you know how do you deal with that? I'm I'm the world's most obedient writer. <laughs> If someone says it's got to be here by Tuesday at 10, it's there at two, Tuesday at 10. Uh, and my, they used to make, laugh at me at uh, various publishers I've been with because I always insisted that they put a date on the contract by which this book has to be delivered. And that's, that's me, you know, that, that's a little bit of buttoned up rigidity about me that I've got. And, you know, it, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, your work and your writing, to me, very, very visual. I mean, I can see the scenes I can imagine you know the the whole thing the looks the comedy is is there a, one of your novels you'd particularly like to see on screen well we had a lot of t- a lot of goes at putting Janice Gentle on on the screen um several scripts are written and all sorts of things and then somehow it didn't happen and I've always thought that would that would last well that would do well you know ma- mainly because it's a you know, it's still going on this debate about women and their size and how they view their bodies and and all that stuff, which is exactly what Janice Gentle was about. I just wanted a heroine, a kind of large woman called Janice, <laughs> um, who was a wonderful writer and who who didn't give up a biscuit, and and who was a very real, very real uh, kind of authentic person in a way. Not your perfect heroine. Flawed, flawed heroine. People, you know, I still meet people who have their, their dog-eared copy of Janice Gentle Women. It just wasn't, you know, and I'm not flying my own flag, but it just wasn't written about them, that sort of thing. That sort of ordinary women and what they, you know, what it, what it is actually like when you go into Topshop and you bust the zip. Yeah, I, th- I definitely ahead of your time in, in many ways. And do you do you have a favourite screen adaptation of a book? Um, I'd be interested in what you your favourite one has been. Well, there have been some really, you know, my my favourite book in the whole world is Jane Eyre, and there have been some really good adaptations of that. Um, but I think my favourite overall and above, and I've only just rewatched it again, is um, The Pride and Prejudice with Jennifer Eels um, as. Uh, Elizabeth Bennett, and, um, and I'm going to forget his name. I always do. Uh, Colin Firth. That's the one. The beautiful Colin Firth. Uh, that to me is a complete is complete perfection. It's a joy. It's a joy, isn't it? And I ne- I never seem to get tired of watching it. And of course, there's this wonderful thing now where you can actually binge watch <laughs> whole series, and it's so beautifully paced and you know just a short ep- I mean I, I, I agree I totally agree well I think the other thing about it this time I was watching it like probably slightly more critically I, I don't know but I was thinking whoever aided the dialogue and uh, it, it's wonderful and but b the way it looks it's not dated so many of these adaptations you know they've gone in for the sort of whatever the look is at the time you know the hair or the clothes style or something and if you look at that adaptation of Pride and Prej, um, it's of its time it, it does seem to be of the you know early 19th century yeah it's, be- it's beautiful isn't it I, I mean I think the characterization is just terrific the, the casting was brilliant yeah yeah anyway I might have to have another look um he is so gorgeous he is so gorgeous he, he was he was perfect in that because he he changes you can see this gradual gradual change throughout the whole the whole film and I, I think he I mean yes he looks gorgeous but actually his acting was was really good I really just absolutely perfect for that that character anyway I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, publishing I'm obviously interested in publishing I'm a tiny publisher of of children's books but um I think what would be really interesting for me you started in publishing albeit not the publishing we're talking about way back but how you've seen things changing over time since you've been writing what what, what's your perspective on on publishing well publishing and agents actually both fall into the same category that's no (laughs) Dear, I, I'm at the right end of my life to be saying things like this. You know, don't think they're your friends. Uh, I'm not saying you aren't, Kay. Um, in both cases, 
they want to make money out of you and you want them to pursue selling your books and you know making something of you um and i i'm always astonished i, I was the first time it happened to me was with my first publisher uh which was bodley head and um they had been all over me like a rash with my first book and then my agent for some reason i'm not sure why took me to a different publisher for my second book and i had been invited to a bodley head's anniversary party i think it was their bicentennial or something and um absolutely everyone just turned their back on me it was like i didn't exist anymore that was a harsh uh, experience of that sort of thing but that is what goes on in publishing and i always say step back you know keep keep a little back with, of yourself so that if things go wrong with publishing you don't get knocked on the other hand you get wonderful publishers who do support you if you stay with them they support you and they love you and they look after you but always remember that um at the heart of it they do at some especially now you know they they really do need to make money you you have actually had quite a few different publishers and uh you're in the process of reissuing six novels new jackets new forewords written by you which i always like because you get a, a new view on things um can you tell me about that you know the the different publishers and and the reissuing Yes, um, my agent was profoundly good at, it, at getting me a publisher that suited me, which is a critical thing. Um, I changed three times in the, with the first three novels, I think, which was very strange. But it was all strange to me then. So um, I've never really been properly edited. Um, I've never had an editor who I who stayed the course with me, not for any reasons of my reasons, but because of their you know employment, um, except once. I had a really wonderful editor and it was a marvelous experience but on on the whole chopping and changing publishers is not necessarily a good idea. Um I did stay with Faber for a long 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 time and that was great. They are one of the best publishers in in the country um for all sorts of reasons. But but I think it's uh, you know I think you have to be cautious. I think even even Faber has to be fairly ruthless now because you know it, 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 there's so little cake there's so so many writers really so many publishers so many writers i love the idea that all these new small imprints are blossoming which bodes well i think but it certainly doesn't bode well for bill paying yeah indeed um i actually met you um at the national welsh uh, writing center a wonderful place and beautiful countryside um, and it was a retreat that you led which is brilliant for budding authors and those wanting to sharpen up their, their skills and as you know it started me off in a completely new direction you know past was in in tv and radio and now I was embarking on what would eventually become I had no idea publishing and writing and I have to say that I, I'm really indebted to a friend of mine uh, Rosalind Hoyes, who um, also loves your writing, for saying, oh, oh, could you come with me? Could we go together? Uh, really, thanks to Rose, I ended up having this wonderful experience. Anyway, what I was struck um, by was by how encouraging and understanding you were and how easy it seemed to be for you to pass on your, your skills to everyone. Obviously, I now um, believe that writing retreats can be a catalyst for change because they were for me but they can also be quite intense affairs which I found um, for those new to writing. Do you, do you think there's sometimes a degree of healthy competition at work at writing retreats? Well I, I hope I've never led one where there was competition because the most important thing in those initially is to, to have the trust of everybody sitting around the table. You know, you, you've got maximum, you've got probably 16 people who are feeling rather fragile, anxious, you know, writing and reading stuff out that you to, to strangers is, is very challenging. And um, so I always try and make sure that everybody is happy with it. You know, you all bonded well um, before the workshops. I, I did once run a workshop with someone else um, who I shan't, shan't name. When he was doing a workshop, he set up groups of four people and they had to come up with a film title. 
uh, and a film outline and then pitch it. And he would award the million dollars to the best pitch. Well, it wrecked a couple of my poor young younger writers. You know, it, it was a dreadful thing to do. And I think he'd earned his lesson. But um, I think it's not a place for competitiveness. Uh, what I always remember was us all sitting around this huge, great wooden table. And there was a great big stone fireplace. And it was lovely outside space to uh, go out and enjoy. And uh, that, that's my experience and my, my memory of that. So I, I did feel it was quite um, nurturing, but I think it's also inside your head, this lack of confidence. And I think you, I mean, I actually mentioned in my book, because what, one of the, the chapters in my book is about a writing retreat and how uh, really if you had not been the person that you are, I could have definitely been um, put off completely, I, th- I think. But I think you were very encouraging and I think that style really is absolutely right for writing retreats and encouraging as many people as possible. I've also come from a fairly shaky background myself you know I talk about surprise to end up being a novelist um, so I, I I may understand more than some that underlying we you know worry anxiety about it and, and I and as I say I think it's really very hard to sit at a table and open your heart. So um, I love doing it too. I absolutely love doing it. I, I did notice you've been to, the other writing retreat I've been to, um, obviously I'm Scottish, was Moniac Moore. Um, you've been there as well. To, I mean, obviously we didn't get to go out very much because the weather was so so <laughs> bad a lot of the time and it's so cold up there. But um, it, it's just such a beautiful place um, near Loch Ness. Uh, did you have, do you have good memories of there too? I well, the funny thing about it is that I was one of the first tutors to run a course up there when it opened. Um, then it was uh, affiliated to Arvon, which has various centres all over, as you know. Um, and it had been, I think the Fraser family was still very involved with it. It had been the Fraser estate, part of the Fraser estate. Um, and that was hilarious. Someone had told me that the Scots can drink, but by God. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sitting, it was still 4am and people were still reading their pieces. Um, it was great. And then the last time I went, um, it was very much more organised. The accommodation was completely smartened up. But the place itself, the heart of the place, is still exactly the same. I was doing a comedy writing course with Helen Lederer and we had the best time. I mean, I don't think I've drunk vodka at half past 11 at night for a long time but uh, I found myself strangely drawn to this practice Um, they were a great bunch of people we were teaching very funny and she was wonderful and and uh, yeah it was good well that's that's fantastic we'll come on to that because I know you you have quite a good um relationship with Helen even on social media when we're all distanced but do you know how many writing retreats you've done it seems to be rather a lot and you mentioned about Arvon I just for anyone listening can you just say a little bit about Arvon? Arvon is the most wonderful organization it has a it has writing retreats in John Osborne's old house in Shropshire which is wonderful um, at Hebden Bridge um, in Yorkshire which was very close to where Ted Hughes lived in fact, you, you're in Ted Hughes's family home, um, as was. There's a there's another one down in Devon, which is a Devon longhouse in the most beautiful. They're all set in the most wonderful idyllic countryside, um, quite remote. They can take up to sixteen people. You have two tutors, and the whole policy of Arvon is that those tutors will be writers in their own right. So you're not being taught by people who don't actually know what it's like to have to do it. Um, and it was started back in the late 60s, I think, by Ted Hughes and uh, a couple of other poets, mainly to bring groups of school children away for a short time to experience writing because it was going out of the curriculum. Uh, and then it expanded into uh, doing writing retreats for adults. You know, now now it's much smarter. It was very much sort of sandals and lentils when I thought <laughs> I think that what is wonderful about all these writing retreats is that, I mean, having a beautiful location is is wonderful for creative ideas. And you want to be, um, you know, have some sort of stimulation like that that takes you away out of your normal uh, place of, of work and thinking and writing 
to give you a, a new kind of uh, set of ideas to to focus on. I think that's what's what's so great. Can I ask, um, what would you say is your most repeated piece of advice for aspiring writers? Well, I think I think it's it's really woolly, but you know there are no rules. I'm always horrified when I first start running a workshop with a group that um, they come with all these pre-digested ideas that other tutors that they, they've told me you have to do this and don't start with the weather and you know whole millions of different silly rules and the important thing about writing is to find your authorial voice so that's my first thing is to say go with what you need to do not what someone's telling you to do um i'm just wondering about uh this social media i mean i like your exchanges with with helen and i know i think she's she started a new uh, award for women writers which is a really a great thing that she's done um but do you do you like social media <laughs> well i don't really understand the trouble is between ourselves and it won't be anymore um helen will send me a, a, a thing saying with a wonderful tweet in it saying oh, if only the ice cream had been brown or something and i don't know what's gone on before that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to find out. So um, the, I get these terrific sort of, you know, strange things and, and, and respond to them um, occasionally uh, to her delight, I think. Um, you know, we both delight in each other's sense of humour, but if, if she only knew that I hadn't a clue what's going on, really. <laughs> Maybe she does. Maybe she does. But I, I, I think it's a, there's a lovely rapport there. And if anyone's looking, you know, um, on Twitter, it's actually it's actually very nice to read. We actually we we've been a bit sad because we usually meet maybe once twice a month uh, in up in Soho um, or or in in the bar above Waterstone in Piccadilly, uh, just to sort of have you know drink and chat really. And she has started this great thing called Comedy Women in Print, which is an annual prize. Uh, and not before time, I think. Um, I haven't. I've, I'm conscious. I haven't talked about all of the things that I was uh, going to, but um, I, I am thinking that you know you have done so much already. You know, sixteen novels, short stories, writing retreats, huge numbers of writing retreats, uncovering new authors. We haven't even talked about your voluntary work in prisons, yeah. reissuing novels. <laughs> Um, you know, is there something you're particularly keen still to do in the coming years? Well, I really would like to get that play done and out. Um, I said to the bare, a bare bones of it, or no, not, actually not a bare bones, let's be honest, Mrs Cheek, it wasn't the bare bones. It was far too overwritten. But I sent the initial one I did of it to lovely old Nick Heitner, and he was, he was very complimentary, but it, of course it was disastrously bad. Um, but I had got the voice. It's about Anne Cleves, Anna Cleves, and I had got the voice, uh, which is good. Um, I just think the Me Too movement made me start thinking about Anna and Henry and the way women were treated then and the way women are showcased now. And so that's basically what I'm struggling with. I'd like to do that. And what's it, what's it called? Does it have a title already? Well, I think it, it, it goes from um, An Amenable Woman to daughter of Cleve, to anything you like, really. It's it's um, there are so many resonant things about Anna in my head that uh, I'll come up with something. I'm sure you will. The titles are all great. Um, do you want to say something about your voluntary work just before um we end the session? Because I feel as if it's quite an important thing that you do, and maybe people don't know very much about that work. No, well, it's going into prisons um, as a volunteer and running workshops. And I have to tell you, people used to say, oh, you are marvellous to do that. Can I just tell you one little snippet, which was very funny, that uh, I just started going into teaching prisons. And I was in Wiltshire. And um, just as I was leaving, phone rang. I picked it up. And it was a friend. And I said, um, I, I can't talk at the moment. I'm going to prison. <laughs> all um everyone thought it was wonderful of me to do it it wasn't it was something i thoroughly enjoyed and i taught him holloway which was dreadful but the women were amazing i mean there were women in there who could not read or write but you'd set an exercise 
and they would be able to remember in their heads the next week and they would come and they would read it out of their minds and they could go back to it. So they'd learned how to cover up the fact that they weren't literate. Um, you know, but, but other stuff in Holloway was dreadful. Then, But also I taught in men's prisons. They were the best fun. I mean, terrible really, but they were great fun. And some wonderful writing. I mean, my... In both cases, you know, pr they won prizes for their writing, the Kirster Awards. Um, this, uh, you come away feeling it's so, it is so sad that so many have slipped through the net in their schooling and they don't actually know what's in them. They, you know, they, they could be really thrilled by having, you know, written a short story that people were listening to. And also I used to run, get some poets to come in and do poetry with them, which was wonderful. Well, that sounds that sounds fabulous. Quite inspiring work, and and it's it, I mean basically it's lovely that you're just saying look I, I really enjoy doing it. It's a, a joy to do makes it makes it much more important. I mean I, I you know I, I used to have to go out through a different pathway from the men would go off to their cells and I would go that way to the way out. But there was one day when I kind of forgot myself and started following the men into the cells until. Somebody in a uniform came up and said, I don't think you really want to go there. <laughs> we, we, I loved them and, and they loved me and we had a great time. Um, that's wonderful, uh, Mavis. I would like to include some information for anyone wanting to find out more about your work and your play, every, everything that's, that's coming up in the future as well. Where should they look first? Well, I suppose my agent's website, that's um, Peter Fraser Dunlop. Um, my Facebook pages, I'm not doing very much because nobody's doing very much. You know, a couple of things have been can cancelled. Um, I'll probably be doing Wales again. Lucy Llewellyn has been on, on and said, you know, they're hoping to open up soon up in, in Wales, the t Tynwyth North, uh, the writing centre. How um, do you pronounce it? I thought it was Tynwyd. It's spelled T-Y and then you word N-E-W-Y-D-D, -D, but it's actually Tynwyth. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm glad I have finally found out after all these years. It's very hard to remember, but it is Tim with, yeah. yeah. And you obviously have um, a book club as well, which I joined up, and it's great because you can get free uh, little short stories. And that's uh, uk. So I include all these links um, with the podcast too. Um, but Mavis, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you remotely after all this time. And I, I wish you all the very best and look forward to what happens in the future. And maybe I'll bump into you sometime. And I really do admire what you've done, I must say. So, you know, I don't think it's much to do with me. I think it's all to do with you. How kind. I bet you say that to everyone. <laughs> it's true. No, so many are all to do with me. No, no. No, um, no you've done fantastically. It's a fantastic thing to have done. Thank you, Mavis. It's been lovely talking to you. And um, all that remains for me now is to thank Mavis and to thank you for spending time with us and listening to the Bell Books and Stories podcast. Studio production was by Perrin Sledge and I'm Kay Hutchison. There are lots of interesting podcasts in the series now, Born Free, Downton Abbey, Mavis Cheek, and coming soon, a podcast about how books end up on screen. I hope you'll join me next time. In the meantime... Bye for now.